So, uh, so my name is Kelly Norton. I'm from the uh, GWT team, and uh, as Greg said, I'm uh, here to talk to you about um, Ajax usability. So, two things I'm going to try not to do during this uh, talk. One is uh, show much code. The other one is actually fall off this elevated stage, um, which sort of makes me nervous. Um, so anyway, uh, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. So uh, first, I'm going to start with a really brief uh, overview. Usability is a really broad term, as is HCI and all the other terms you see in this, uh, in this realm. So I'm really just going to start with a, a brief overview of, of what I'm actually talking about in these slides. Um, next. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about the process of uh, the process of creating applications with humans in mind, and I'm going to do a little bit of trying to convince you uh, that thinking about usability from the very beginning is actually a better approach to building applications in general, but especially AJAX applications. And then finally, we're going to end with something which I hope will be kind of fun, and that is um, there are a number of very common mistakes in AJAX applications that hurt usability. Some of them are almost trivial to fix. And so I want to go through a few of them and, and talk about why they matter um, and sort of encourage you to pay attention to these things as you build your own AJAX applications. So first of all, usability, the obligatory definition of what I'm going to talk about. Um, it, is both, it is two things. Uh, it is a quality metric for an interface, which is sort of, you know, you can say it in a compl complicated way, but it's really generally all about how easy an application is to use. But it's also, uh, to, this term is also applied to the things that you do to make an application easier to use, uh, right? So it's sort of a bimodal term. Um, so um, usability is often, uh, it's often a culture all unto itself. Um, there are people who, when you're ready to launch, you call them up on the hotline, they shuttle into your room, and they tell you all the things that are wrong with your application, and then you start over. Like, this is how it always works, and even though it doesn't really work, we continue to do it. Um, so basically, I want to start making my plea, which is um, usability is really key to the success of your application. So you know, there was a, a short talk yesterday where uh, Bruce uh, Johnson just continued to repeat that the goal is great products, happy users. So it's really hard to find an example of an application that is considered a great application that has happy users that is bad in usability. Um, it, it's just hard to find one, right? It's, it's really fundamental to the equation. So as, as developers of these applications, um, what you're really trying to do is maximize your experience. And I would go as far to say, even if you're writing the server code deep down in the bowels and you spend your entire day talking about zero copy buffers, you're still trying to maximize user experience. So, so let's talk a little bit about the process of building, uh, about building usable applications. Um, so as I said before, um, there's typically been this sort of uh, user experience, from the engineering perspective, there's been this user experience as a uh, late game consultant um, who sort of jumps in and, and fixes things up. Generally, uh, it's called, uh, let's give it to them and make them make it, and have them make it look pretty. Um, making it look pretty, making it usable, two different things. Um, but I'm actually going to start to encourage you that actually these, these roles aren't all that different. Um, and I'll cover this in a later slide. Um, but, uh, but I'm going to say that they should actually begin to work together on an application from the very beginning. Uh, the other thing, uh, and I'll describe what this is, do task analysis up front. And then there's a cycle of developing an application. It goes something like this. Design, implement, test, design, implement, test, design, implement, test, and it just keeps going. And at some point, you end up with an application that's ready to release. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So let's start with the whole user experience versus engineering debacle. Um, so you have two, uh, two different sets of people. They both have the same goal, which is producing a good application that makes users happy. They both have two very valuable and distinct uh, viewpoints on how to make that happen, and we tend to push them in different rooms or engage them at different parts of the development process. Um, in, your next, uh, in your next project, um, try, to actually, uh, try to actually start working with them from the beginning. Um, it actually changes the game quite a bit. As a matter of fact, I actually think that uh, 
that with uh, all applications that have a user interface, you should actually start with the user interface first. Because all requirements that trickle into the system that determine the architectural needs on your server, those are all dictated by what you plan to accomplish, what you plan to accomplish in human terms, the needs you're actually trying to fulfill for the user. So these people have the same goal, and they can both bring something to the table. So getting them involved early is actually uh, key to making this happen. Uh, so another thing, I don't, I don't really, I'm, I'm not sort of a big pre-planning person. Like everyone else, when someone wanted me to write requirements, I shuddered and tried to make myself disappear for a while. However, if there is one thing that I think has major payoff in doing early, that's a little process called task analysis. And that is, and it's really nothing more than explicitly stating the needs of your users. So, you know, if you're building an email application, it's very clear, one of the tasks is your user is gonna have to send email. One of the things they're gonna need to send email is to be able to uh, find email addresses. The fact that you call all these things out has a little bit of a ripple effect. One is you, you just write down on paper, pull out paper, scribble all these things down, you know, uh, what the user actually needs to accomplish, the things they need to accomplish the goal, and the steps involved in doing it. By doing that, you, you, uh, you basically prevent another phenomenon, which is um, I start with a system design, I actually start with a server, I come up with something that I think looks really elegant. I can totally convince myself that a user looks like that. Um, if, you, uh, if you do it the other way around, it actually keeps you honest um, as you move forward um, in designing, your, in designing the, um, the server. The other thing it does is it keeps you from doing things that aren't even necessary. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everyone in here has implemented something that has never actually affected production code and is probably still sitting out in production code somewhere. By knowing what you're actually going to do for your users, you can, in, in essence, eliminate some work because you don't have to implement uh, the really cool uh, architectural design that, that, from an abstract level, looks really nice and really makes your design seem clean. Um, so the whole story, the whole, uh, the underlying principle there is need dictates design. So this is little uh, UML uh, guy. Um, it's just sort of a way of reminding us that humans aren't really, it's really hard to represent humans. So it's best to actually understand the human first and then model the parts of the human that you're gonna try to address in your application. So, um, so actually understand the needs, then actually go and design uh, according to those needs. Um, because need dictates design, uh, not system elegance. System elegance uh, has a tendency to sort of make uh, UML guy unhappy uh, because it forgets about UML guy. He was the reason, we were trying to make him happy in the first place, right? So uh, I, I mentioned a little bit about this uh, cycle, and that's really hard to see, I apologize. Uh, it's actually, um, so I mentioned before, design, implement, test. Um, so I'm sure that uh, everyone here has, uh, has done a project um, with what they call the waterfall method. Uh, you start, you plan, you design, you implement, you uh, do some testing, you decide some things are broken, you have a crisis moment where you gotta figure out if you're gonna launch it in a broken state, Maybe your users will tell you more, you launch it. It gets, just gets really fuzzy. There's this sort of undocumented feedback loop. Well, it's documented now, but there's this undocumented uh, link in the waterfall chain where you ended up revisiting the nodes anyway. So why not do it explicitly? As a matter of fact, you can sort of make the most of this, um, make the most of this, uh, this iterative design um, in that you can, uh, you take your task analysis you sit down with your need, the needs that you uh, called out, you take a subset of them, you implement the thing for them, you actually put it in front of users, they tell you explicitly if you got it right. You turn around, you redesign, fixing the things that you messed up the first time and pulling in some more of those tests, you implement again, you put it in front of users, you just keep doing this. At some point you realize that the implementation that's gonna come out of the next cycle is actually a really good application uh, and we can actually release this. Now, People are always skeptical of this model, and they say, I don't have time, doing these circles makes me dizzy. I don't have time to do this continuously. So, um, so let's, just, let's just get it right the first time. Well, um, the story has always been, you don't get it right the first time. When it involves user interfaces, you always mess it up. Um, you always mess up some little thing. You always have to revisit something. Humans are just really hard to anticipate what they need. Um, and it's really hard to catch the subtleties of interaction, especially when you start talking about decoupled parts and you know, they have dependencies in terms of you know, a person needs to reach the contact list, but you forget that 
you know, there's a subtle interaction in the way you decided to bring up the contact list, which actually makes it impossible for you to copy and paste in the, the address. Those little things that you really find late in the game if you do the waterfall method. Well, if you're actually doing iterative, a lot of times it's actually less expensive because you're actually making progress at a much better rate towards your goal um, than if you were just doing the straight waterfall method. Um, so having sort of, uh, having sort of encouraged you to, uh, to, to do sort of, uh, you know, more user-centered design practices, I'm now going to jump into that part where I talk about the things that, uh, the very common things that people tend to mess up. Um, so the first one of these um, is uh, give users feedback. So when we were all doing static web pages, uh, we had the uh, one great luxury, and that is whenever I pushed on a button or a link or uh, anything else in the interface, the little throbber in the corner of the browser started spinning, which meant that if I was lazy, the user generally knew that the browser was doing something. When we start talking about AJAX applications, oftentimes the throbber is not engaged at all. You may be communicating with a server, and it, unless you actually tell the user, it's completely transparent. So let me give you an example. So, uh, so this is my uh, Web 2.0 application. Uh, Web 2.0 is about making lists, right? So I'm going to make lists. Um, actually, I'm going to make lists in this application. So. Um, so I'm going to just type something. So I plan to go shopping and then eat lunch. Okay, so go shopping. Uh, what happened? Oh, oh, now I realize it was saving, right? Uh, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's one of those things that it's easy to forget because, um, you know, you handle all the actions, but you just forgot to, uh, you forgot the realization of the world, which is when I'm not sitting at my desk testing on my machine, um, network speed is, uh, is actually not infinite, um, or relatively virtually infinite. So, um, so when people start to use this, they suddenly get confused, and oftentimes uh, you'll find uh, AJAX applications don't actually, so, you know, I hit enter then rather than pressing the add button. Oftentimes what happens is that people, they type it in, they hit enter, and then when nothing, when they don't get feedback, they assume, oh, they didn't do the, the little key enter thing, I had to hit add. And so they go back and they hit add again. Well, then they have two entries, right? Um, and so to, to demonstrate how little feedback you need to actually uh, to overcome this. Um, so there's the same application um, with feedback turned on. The simplest feedback I can think of, um, go shopping, same delays, but it's obvious what it's doing now, right? I mean, it says explicitly it changed. It sort of gives an indication. So it's like a really simple thing. And this is probably the biggest mistake in AJAX applications by far. Um, it's just not updating the interface to tell people, hey, I'm doing something on your behalf. It's just not clear to people that you're working on their behalf. Okay, so another one. And I actually use one of, one of our products to demonstrate this one because uh, Google or not, I, like the, I actually like this. This is nice. Another thing that, um, that people forget is that when you're building applications that stay up for a long time, and, and sort of touch the server behind the scenes without a page refresh, um, you start to run in the error conditions in a lot more common cases. So for instance, I'm on Gmail, I uh, pick up my laptop, and I walk to another room. In that time, I got dropped off of uh, off wireless, right? But I, I'm not gonna refresh Gmail because I walked into another room. To me, it's an application, and so, um, and so when I get to the other room, I'm dropped off wireless, I have no network connectivity, I could sit here for the next five minutes clicking on links and trying to figure out why my browser is broken because it's not responding. But it's actually better to make these error states um, present. So this is actually really, uh, I mean, this is a nice touch. You, uh, in Gmail, if you, uh, if you fall off of uh, wireless, you, uh, you get some indication that you're off of wireless, and it actually tells you exactly what it's trying to do to fix it, which is it's going to try to connect again. You even get a little clever, uh, we're back when it comes back on. Right? So, so these sort of, these cases that you would typically, um, these cases that you typically wouldn't think so much about, um, and, and especially things that you wouldn't think so much about the handling of them, become really important. Another example, so what if they had handled this by putting up an alert box that says network error? So, you know, I would be stuck. I would probably have to hit like 15 error messages before I could even get back in control of the browser to, uh, to refresh or whatever was required, right? So, um, so these sort of states become much more important. Um, 
Another one, reduce the chance of errors. So now that we're not doing full, full, full page refreshes, we have an excellent opportunity to begin to do some of the things that have been very common um, when you're talking about desktop applications. So to give you an example, um, and this is, this is a funny one. Actually, I should have uh, uh, gone back off that one to see if uh, people would have selected the right thing. So for, for a number of reasons, we were doing full, re full page refresh. Confirmation seemed like a better, uh, like a, it was actually easier and it actually, you know, when the page was going away, sometimes it was the only thing you could do. Um, but it turns out we've always, uh, you know, at least in, uh, in the past few years, we've basically considered confirmation to be bad. It's especially bad when uh, it's hard to orient yourself against the OK cancel, right? And in this case, are you sure you want the world to not come to an end, right? I mean, so you have to sort of figure out the orientation of the uh, English before you can choose which of those buttons actually applies, right? It, it's actually a really bad thing because it, um, it, it causes a complete halt, even in the common case. Like, I totally intention, intended to delete that message, but it's now in my face asking me a question and the selections make no sense and I have to orient myself against which is the correct and half the time I end up not deleting the thing I intended to delete. So in this case, I think you'll, uh, if you were faced with ending the world, you probably won't the undo over the confirmation, at least I would. Um, and you know, this is, we have the opportunity to do this in, in Ajax applications now. And these are things that you would typically find now in desktop applications and you know, that the general usability uh, world has been talking about, right? Uh, another thing, it's always a good idea to think about where errors can occur. Um, so, and uh, it, it turns out to actually be, um, it actually turns out to be not that hard if you actually think about what your user is gonna do. And, uh, and it also helps you on other fronts. People always sort of get, uh, they get a little nervous when they start talking about, you start talking about graphic design because they're like, there are just so many options, I don't know where to put things. Well, it turns out many things have a place just from preventing errors. So let me step to this. So the first thing that uh, you can imagine is the classic problem of, I hit the send button twice, right? Well, that has an easy fix. I just disable the send button whenever you click on it. I have that option now, right? So another, uh, another thing, what about mobile users? Well, on an iPhone, my finger is that big. What is the likelihood that I'm going to uh, hit send without trying to send myself back to the inbox sometimes? It's actually very low. So we'll fix that. All right, but what if I hit the wrong button? So let's actually look at each of these cases. What if I hit the wrong button? If I hit discard, well, that's probably gonna have an undo on it, right? So worst case, I have to hit the undo and I get my message back. Um, if I save a draft, it's not really any problem. If I was trying to discard, then I just discard it now. If I was trying to send, well, I just did an unnecessary save and I send again. What if I hit the send button? <laughs> so it's a pretty, it's a pretty big penalty for uh, accidentally hitting the send button, right? So what complicated thing could we do here to prevent this error from happening a lot? You know, move it over, right? So it's funny because, you know, a lot of these things, it sort of starts with thinking about how people are gonna use the interface. And, and these are sort of really simple examples of decisions that you might have a crisis over because graphic design is all about, you know, putting the appropriate white space in and trying to figure out how to space things. Well, it turns out much of this stuff actually derives from use, not from making things look pretty. Um, so I'm gonna spend more time on this one because uh, one, this is another really important one um, it's also one that uh, I'm proud to say that uh, the GWT team has thought a lot about on a number of fronts. So, to drive this point home, uh, here's a quote from uh, Jakob Nielsen, um, not even about Ajax applications. And he basically says that since 1994, people have been telling him consistently in user studies, can you speed up the downloads? Like actually asking them, can you speed up the downloads? And this has only gotten worse with Ajax applications. Um, so, so now you're talking about loading tons of code, lots of JavaScript files. Um, and so things have just gotten slower. So one of the concerns that users have been given since essentially the, uh, the web hit the scene has been speed things up. And we seem to be going backwards in this regard. So let's actually relate that to humans. So human attention, it turns out that, that how fast you can load is not sort of an arbitrary 
uh, it's not sort of an arbitrary, th or how fast you want to load is not sort of an arbitrary thing. There are, are actually some metrics out there. Um, there was lots of work ages ago. I mean, people did empirical studies uh, in like the 50s to determine, um, you know, what the tolerances were in terms of human attention. It turns out for people to perceive something as instantaneous, so think like frames in an animation or, you know, uh, sequential updates on the screen, for people to actually see that as uh, instantaneous, um, and, and this is an important metric because it also means, it's also sort of a measure of responsiveness from user, user interface. So anytime you do something with the user interface, it should respond to you in 0.1 seconds in order to remain instantaneous. Now, the next uh, sort of important number is one second, which is sort of, I'm carrying out a task. This is the delay I can sort of endure with no real feedback and still perceive this as being the same task. Um, this is actually the relevant number for page loads, sadly enough. And we'll talk, we'll talk more about that. And then 10 seconds is, 10 seconds is what, what I call the, uh, the dig reddit or slash dot number. This is the n number for which if you go past it, that's, you're highly likely to have your people go off and do something else because it's just, there's just a big enough break in there that you could, it, it, your attention wanders and you're highly likely to go off and do something else. So now let's go back to page loads. What's in an Ajax page load? I will, uh, I will confess, this is an embarrassingly simplified version of what page loads look like in Ajax applications. But basically, I gotta download a bunch of resources, I gotta run some scripts, and then the render is gonna run and that's when you get something on the screen that you can play with. And we've been sort of calling this time to interaction. Um, and uh, this is a really important number because, as I said before, this number really needs to be one second or less because you're essentially carrying out a task in, mo in almost all Ajax applications. So you, the ideal here is getting this, the uh, app up in one second. That's a really hard number to hit. So, but let's talk about how we can actually start fast. And I, uh, I, I know some people have probably already talked about this, but I just want to mention some, uh, a few things that, uh, that really, really help this equation. Probably the number one thing is reducing the number of HTTP requests. Um, they're, uh, you know, they're inefficient, and on top of that, uh, the browser limits the number that can, that can actually be outstanding. So that is probably the number one thing you can do. On top of that, actually addressing, aggr uh, aggressively caching it in the browser um, helps a lot. So for instance, if to load your application the second time, you don't have to go back and say, hey server, has this changed? No, no, it's much better if you can just load the code that's sitting on your machine, like right out of cache. Um, for more uh, in-depth treatment, I hope that, I think this talk has already uh, gone on, but I hope you uh, went to see the deployment, deployment best practices, because this is something that I believe that we, uh, we've done a really great job on, um, the GW team that it, GWT team that is in terms of figuring out a really good deployment practice to make that possible. Um, the other thing that I'll mention is constructing UI incrementally. And I'll talk more about that in just a second. So let's actually uh, compare um, and, and let's talk about what we mean by starting fast. So this is a comparison in which I'm not gonna actually name names, uh, except for the bottom, which is one of our samples. Um, the other, the top one is actually um, sort of an application that doesn't really do any of these practices. It's, it, it's bad on the HTTP um, headers. Uh, it doesn't load incrementally. Um, it actually does a lot of chatting to the server to pull in a bunch of little individual files, sometimes little miniature images that are about the size of the HTTP headers in general. Um, and so um, let's actually talk about these numbers in the human attention terms that I talked about earlier. Both of these applications are not complicated applications. Um, they are actually not applications that would be in a production application. Both of them blow the one second number. And by the way, this is not first page hit. This is actually second page hit. So there is some cache going on here. So the, the second one does pretty well. Um, it actually, uh, you know, gets, it basically gets things downloaded in about a second you know, runs about 250 milliseconds of code and then the renderer goes off for some time. Um, the top app takes a really long time to download, runs a good bit of code, like 600 uh, milliseconds of code, which is actually a very significant number. I'll talk more about this in a second, but if you remember, we really wanna get our UI events done in 100 milliseconds and to blow it by sixfold 
is uh, not even good for a startup situation, which is generally the most expensive event you'll see in an AJAX application. Um, so, um, so basically, if you compare these two, the bottom one almost hits the one second time we're, we're looking for. The top one actually goes past the 10 second time, which, is, uh, which puts you, you know, going off the dig, reddit, or slash dot, right? I mean, this is, it, it actually went beyond the, the other metric, uh, which was not even the relevant metric. It was sort of the doomsday uh, scenario. And like I said, these are not even, not even big applications. But you can definitely tell here by the size of the red, which is download, um, that the HTTP headers is a really big deal. So, uh, so I mentioned, we're gonna talk more about the uh, 0.1 second uh, update thing again. And, and so we sort of have a term for this and it's called let, let browsers breathe. And that is uh, every event that you execute. So anytime you write JavaScript in a browser, it's gonna be executing in an event. It's some event coming from the browser's UI event queue. In order for the browser to be able to respond to the user uh, in a way that the, that the user perceives as instantaneous, you shouldn't take more than that 0.1 milliseconds in any, area, any of your events. Click handlers, timers, any of that. Um, otherwise, the, the, otherwise the, the user um, might not actually perceive this as being instantaneous. It feels sluggish. That's typically what you hear people say about applications that cheat on this metric. The app feels sluggish. You know, examples are like the, the uh, quintessential auto-suggest. So you've probably all used an auto-suggest where you type and as you keep typing, it's sort of fighting you. It's like I, I hit a key and it just, it gets a little slower each time and it feels like, and then you stop and you start backing up and it's taking a really long time to get rid of the, uh, the letters with backspace. This is sort of classic starving the UI event queue. Um, and, it, and in order to basically bring the usability of applications up to a level that is on par with desktop applications, we really have to start thinking about these things in the human attention terms, not in what's convenient or what's easy. Because a lot of times, what's easy in JavaScript is also often what gets done. But it actually has no bearing whatsoever on making, happy, making users happy or making great products, right? So uh, another thing here, uh, do it the web way. One of the reasons why people love the web, it has, has its own UI conventions, a small subset of them, and they're familiar and they're comfortable to people. Installers, not so comfortable. That's like a, you run an installer, it's an open can of worms, but if I try something out in an Ajax application, I have a few safety latches. I can hit the back button, I can hit the stop button, I can change the URL, I know about these things. These are the things that, uh, that make the browser a familiar place, even for people who aren't familiar with technology. So examples are, and I sort of mentioned them, uh, hitting the back forward buttons. Um, I'm gonna show this really, really quickly for those who haven't seen it. Um, this is actually one of the samples from uh, GWT. And basically, the key here is to put the back and forward buttons in places where they make sense. And that is actually in the same way that we sort of found places where people could, uh, would run into errors, you actually look for the places where these web conventions make sense. So anytime you click on a hyperlink, you fully expect to be able to hit a back button and get to that previous state. Even if it just so happens that that state was generated by a bunch of Ajax code, not by an actual get request. Um, the other thing, people copy and paste URLs all the time. So there's a whole segment of people in, the, in, in retail who basically think Ajax is off limits because nobody has sort of supported URLs. You don't see it a lot. And so if you're in a case where you literally, um, like for instance, if you're selling sweaters, um, it's probably a good idea to make it so that when I'm doing that sweater, I can copy the URL, send it to someone who's gonna buy it for me for Christmas and, uh, and have them actually be able to pull it up in a browser. I mean, I know that everyone has sent a URL only to have someone IM them back and say, um, that just brought up their homepage, right? So, so URLs, I mean, after all, that is the spirit of the URL, right? So, um, so having the ability to also maintain that URL, which is key to the internet, is, is crucial. Another thing is, you know, smaller population, but people, people use the right click button. They use it for things other than stealing images, really. Um, they, they use it, there's reload in there. there. There are all sorts of things that tie back to the comfortable things you can do on the web, and it's in the right click menu. Don't turn it off for them. 
allow them to have the right click button. Okay, so I grouped a few things under uh, use visuals effectively. Um, it doesn't fully cover, it's uh, just sort of picking in the visual realm, but there's some things that just consistently have uh, gone wrong. The first one is, uh, I can click on both of these. Which one actually communicates that I can click on it? It's a very simple one, but the problem is with Ajax, you can you start to wire up event listeners on things that, you know, aren't links, there aren't buttons. They may actually be styled appropriately in some cases, but, you know, there are these really clever affordances in the browser, and affordances is just a sophisticated way of saying it tells you what it can do, right, um, visually. Um, actually taking the time to turn these things on goes a really long way. So, and it turns out actually doing this one is a remarkably large amount of CSS code, right? turning on a pointer to actually communicate that you can click on this thing. Um, the same, uh, same concept. Um, for whatever reason, you see a lot of sort of menus that don't really communicate themselves at menus. By the way, I'm gonna put a star by this because I'm gonna come back and tell you that if you were gonna do this, you should have used the native uh, select element anyway. But there's standard conventions for uh, for these sort of things. And one of the major complaints about Ajax interface is that they violate these conventions. They come up with their own clever conventions for doing things. And while there was a perfectly good way to do it that actually got across what, what could actually be done to an element, people for some reason deviate from it. And it's, you know, don't deviate from it unless you have a, unless you are convinced that you have a better solution. And by convinced, I mean has been through a lot of user testing and shown to be effective. So, their very simple affordances um, can go a really long way. All right, animation. Animation has been like the staple of Web 2.0, right? So I, I will tell you, I'm not gonna tell you not to use animation, but I'm going to encourage you to use it wisely. What do I mean by wisely? I mean, here's some good uses. Uh, changes that aren't made by the user. Really good for animation. It actually calls your attention to something you didn't initiate, right? Um, reinforcing direct manipulation, drag and drop, would actually be kind of odd if you had a drag and drop interface that didn't actually animate in some way to, to show you that, hey, you're moving this thing, right? Um, the other thing is showing progress. It often makes sense to sort of show time progress with an animation. Um, the other one is what I call code red level attention grabbing. That means that like, this thing is so important that you really shouldn't continue doing what you're doing until you actually pay attention to what I'm saying. Um, and the reason is, is because uh, consistently user studies have shown that if you put animation on an interface, it consistently disrupts whatever you're doing. Like people read enormously slower when there are animations going on um, somewhere in the periphery. Um, so what are bad uses? Impressing your friends or family or trying to make your dog dizzy, right? So it's just sort of a way of saying like, I acknowledge that people are using animation because they want their, uh, their Ajax applications to feel like they're of a higher quality, but, I actually, but why not actually use them in a meaningful way? It still gives the impression of quality, but you're actually helping usability. And, and actually what happens is that people see an interface the first time and they see the animation and they perceive it as being, cool, that's slick, that's, uh, it actually looks like it's well done, right? You spend a lot of time working on it, but as you use it consistently, the unneeded animation becomes a distraction. So it actually hurts long-term use. When you're talking about applications, I don't know of many applications that strive for short-term use, right? You want people to, oh, it'd be great if people showed up and then left next week, right? We really want long-term use, right? Okay, so um, I'm not gonna give this one near enough treatment. Um, and that is, consider the folks using assistive technologies. And, and by that, I, uh, I basically will say uh, screen readers. Um, so it turns out Ajax, this is one of the places where Ajax has had a, lot, it's had a uh, lot of unanswered questions about how do you actually give somebody an Ajax application using a screen reader or some other assistive technology and actually have them be able to make sense of what you're giving them, right? Uh, and so I'm just gonna give you some general tips here and I'm not gonna talk in a lot of detail. Um, that URL looks dark, so if you guys want that URL, stop by and I'll give it to you. Basically, the first tip is Use native widgets. There has been a lot of thought with the native widgets about how they interact with screen readers. So it's like getting a year of work for free if you use native widgets with regard to screen readers. And I'm talking about really hard problems. 
Um, I mean, these are things that you would not want in your critical path. Um, so native, and, and so the native widgets give it to me free. They also happen to make a lot more sense for people who aren't using uh, assistive technologies. Um, the other thing is, uh, and, and, and I should also, I'll also mention that GWT actually has a nice patch going on right now that, uh, to support some of the uh, web accessibility initiatives, uh, accessibility for rich internet applications. And to, and to basically give you a really uh, quick summary of that, that is, you know, with something that looks like a document, it's really easy to sort of describe the parts of the document to a screen reader. But when you start adding, when you start throwing in something that operates as a tree in the middle of it, how does a screen reader even know what that is? And so uh, the ARIA stuff is actually adding attributes that can communicate that to, to people with assistive technologies. It sort of encapsulates a number of interaction roles that you find in applications, not necessarily in document model view of the world. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we're already, we're already working on this in GBT, and this looks like it is going to be uh, the way that, uh, that AJAX frameworks are gonna go. Um, JAWS 7, which is one of the most widely used screen readers, uh, actually supports this, and there's actually a Firefox plugin screen reader that, uh, that is sort of, you know, leading a lot of the development with this. Um, another thing, focus and keyboard uh, support is essential. Um, it is essential for not just people in assistive technologies. It, for people who are going to use an app day to day, this is really, really key. As a matter of fact, every time we encounter a cool app, uh, we generally uh, go immediately to whatever tree they have and start pressing buttons because you don't find that very often. It's really, really important. Um, and it's excruciatingly important for people with assistive technologies because focus is the way that, that's the only way they have. There is no visual selection when you're using a screen reader. You, you're pretty much stuck with the whole focus equation and how you linearly move through focus. Um, accessibility through validation, I'm gonna mention this really quick. Uh, almost doesn't apply to AJAX applications. So, much, so many of the things are actually changing after the code comes over the server that actually looking at the HTML on the server is in most cases irrelevant. Um, so I, it, it's, it's more important to sort of be aware of things going on in ARIA than it is to just sort of say, validates, must be accessible. Um, and, the, and the last bit of advice, which, is, which I think is, uh, it, it's a really good suggestion, uh, and that is uh, JAWS, actually offers a free download of their screen reader. Just go download it and try to go through an application on one of these. I mean, it, it's really, I mean, it's a, it's a really good experience and actually helps you understand what people ex, uh, experience who are using these sort of technologies. All right, two more. Uh, upstate, update state appropriately. How many times have you seen this in an AJAX application? You, I deleted some messages and uh, now I'm looking at 91 through 100 of 97 total messages. Um, this actually happens when you sort of get into it. So, so a lot of these sort of propagating state change problems, we actually solve this uh, in, a, in a really nice way with a pattern called model view controller. So, um, so, actually, um, so actually using that sort of, those sort of patterns can go a really long way. And what I'm talking about is, you know, actually having sort of using observer and de delegate patterns to, to know when things change. And also for your application, Making specific logic. So in that case, it would have been much better to have been communicating a message deleted um, uh, event rather than that application was probably doing a, uh, they had an on click that just tried to update everywhere they could think of that needed that state, right? Um, and, and, you know, to plug our own self a little bit, this is actually a, um, one of the advantages that GWT has is it actually, you know, encourages these sort of patterns and actually, you know, allows you to use the things that you have used in, in you know, Swing and other, uh, other UI libraries. Okay, and I'm gonna close on testing. I'm gonna close on testing by saying a lot of people are, uh, don't wanna get professionals to test. Before you decide not to get professionals to do your, your user testing, consider that they often pay for yourself. I was talking about going around the iterations. Having a professional do your user testing can often cut out a couple of iterations, at least one iteration, um, because they know how to s extract better evaluation and they know how to sort of isolate and get what you want to, get what you need out of uh, the testing so that you, you know, you, you sort of know coming out exactly what you need to correct, so you're much more efficient. If you're not sold and you still say, eh, I'm not gonna get professionals to do user testing, get somebody, you use it, get your friends to use it, the guy in marketing who thinks, who calls Internet Explorer 6 the internet, get him to use it. I mean, 
Get people to use it. And anytime you see somebody get stuck, take it to heart. Don't get offended. Like, write it down. Because that's, that's like valuable information that they're telling you. Because if it happens to, to just the random sampling that you, uh, that you pick even twice, then there's a really high likelihood it's going to happen when you give it to, you know, 10 million people. All right, and so I'm going to close on just putting this up here and reiterating that, you know, this whole process of uh, design, implement, test really can actually get you to usable applications faster. Um, and I'm happy to take questions now, and if you think of something later, my email address is here. Uh, feel free to email me. So, fire away. If you have a question, raise your hand, I'll bring the mic around. One of the paradigms on the web is the, the back button reloads a page, and GWT seems to be changing that to some extent by having the back button do things like select tabs and push buttons. Uh, what are your comments on that? Um, you know, from a, so from a user standpoint, I don't really see much of a difference between a page load and just switching to another tab. So I will, I will confess, I am biased to looking mostly at user experience. And so, you know, I, I'm sure some people, uh, you know, I'm sure there are some people who have sort of object to our way of using it, but from a user experience standpoint, um, the fact that it actually takes me back to where I was is, is far and away the, uh, the best thing to do when people hit, that, hit the back button. So I would just state user experience. Way up here in the front. Let's Um, I have a question about um, um, using cookies to remember states because uh, I have a tab heavy application and it's really important for the users to remember states and it helps usability a lot if I remember what tab the user last clicked on but I'm finding that I'm proliferating cookies like nothing, you know, 20, 30 cookies just to remember every possible state the user might have kicked, clicked and now um, it's getting ugly. So it's more like an implementation of a good usability question. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, so I have one thought, which is I would, uh, I would caution, caution you against that for one other reason, and that is um, if your application has any likelihood whatsoever of having the same, the same person having the same application open in two different browsers, you make a really confusing situation because, um, you know, I click on, I, I have, you know, Firefox open and Safari open. I click on this tab in Firefox, and I go back and I reload this one in Safari, and suddenly it's on the tab I was on in Firefox. Um, so, um, so yeah, you, there, there are a lot of details there. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think we give you anything explicit to try to handle that. I will tell you that, uh, that the, uh, the user community, uh, community associated with GWT uh, can, can help a lot in this regard because they have a lot of experience with trying to uh, serialize state into cookies. So, uh, you know, um, and we're happy to help as well. But, um, but, but do think about the other implications because there are, um, we, we had tried some things using cookies uh, for even some library associated things and uh, and the whole multi browser thing is is really tricky. Do you have any plans for a default CSS so something like a tab panel really looks like a tab panel out of the box yeah we're actually uh, we're actually trying to do that um, in a way that uh, that it will work sort of in a GWT ish way and that is the default style if I don't specify a style um, the uh, the default style is there. If I do specify a style, all, all of the default style goes away, so I don't have to pay. So one of the problems that you often run into is, uh, is there's a default style, and it's sort of pushed into the system, um, and uh, you can't really, it's hard to get rid of it when you want to apply your own style, uh, or it gets overly dynamic, and you're trying to decide things at runtime with regard to style. So um, I, I would just say that uh, we have talked a lot about something like that. Uh, I am personally very interested in something like that, and I feel pretty confident it's going to happen sometime uh, in the near future, or you know, sometime over the sometime. <laughs> Hi, um, we're currently in the process of taking an internal app with internal trained users and migrating it to a GWT app. Um, one of the challenges we've been having is the fact that the app that they were using would make most people with usability training drop dead. Right. Um, and they became dependent on the foibles and little horrible bugs, I would say, uh, of the old app in their workflow. Um, 
what recommendations would you have regarding um, trying to migrate away from some of the, from what they've known and what they think they need, right. which in many cases is absolutely true, to something that would be easier for someone coming in, because these users also have a high turnaround. Right. Do it carefully. Uh, user experience people will also tell you, um, though they often don't like to tell you once they see an app that they don't really like, familiarity is a, and consistency is a huge part of user experience. So if you have people that, so I mean, so one of the things you can do is sort of, uh, if, you, uh, if you sort of address the things that have been have been sort of plaguing them, because surely there's something in an interface like that that's been plaguing them. You sort of address that. You can sort of use a, a balanced approach where you give them a little bit, and maybe you address some of the other things that, you know, maybe they want to keep uh, around, but you actually know are causing errors or, or something to that effect. But, but keep in mind that uh, a wholesale change is actually, actually probably doesn't make sense because, like I said, familiarity is a big thing. And if you have people who already are very comfortable with a... Uh, uh, with an interface, even though it has wrinkles, if they're familiar with the wrinkles, it may actually make the most sense from, uh, for those users. And you know, long term, maybe you can phase it, uh, phase it out incrementally by just showing them individual. Give them a little bit by saying, you know, here's a place that's been bugging you, and by the way, we've updated this other part. Give it a try, right? So I, it's really a human issue. Um, you know, but I, I would not feel shameful about keeping a little bit of an old, crusty interface around that people are really comfortable with. Um, and especially if you show good faith by trying to find out the things they like about it and trying to, uh, and so even if you did do a wholesale change, if you find the things that people liked about it and made sure they were present in the new interface, um, that's also another way to, to, you know, buy yourself a little bit of uh, faith with, that, uh, with the people using it, right? Any more questions? Kelly, actually, I actually have a question. I'm a user. I spend most of my time on a Windows box, and I get very disconcerted when I have to move over and do something on a Macintosh, as intuitive and friendly as that is. Does doing everything in a browser make that easier, harder? It, it does, because like I said, um, there are conventions. Um, and it, as a matter of fact, there's a, little bit of a, there's a little bit of a nice thing that goes on in a browser, because if you're in, implementing a library, you have to sort of acknowledge that the Mac people are going to find this helpful, the Windows people, Windows people are going to find that helpful. And you have sort of, a, in those cases, you have the freedom to actually step back and say, what actually makes the most sense? What is the you know, combined best experience? So there are little examples like that. Like you know, in, in Windows, the actual pointer on trees is different than on the Mac. You know, so you have a little bit of freedom, which actually makes the most sense. And you can do the thing that makes the most sense. Um, but you know the um, the browser has its own conventions, and and there is sort of a browser UI, and the, the all the history stuff that we talked about is part of that, and you know in a lot of cases that is actually as familiar to people as the uh, as the platform uh, conventions. What other devices, mobile devices, things like the iPhone? What are some of the particular challenges you see once you get off the desktop? I, I my my biggest thing with the iPhone right now is that. Uh, is it's it's great that you have uh, it's great that you have sort of a full web browser there. A few quirks. One is that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a standard interface actually generally has a very high error rate. So you know the close proximity of links on uh, on the iPhone has been problematic. I have an iPhone and have consistently hit the wrong button over and over again on certain applications. Um, the other thing is. Uh, is getting the uh, apps to load fast is a really, really hard problem uh, on the iPhone. Additionally, it throws things out of the cache uh, very aggressively. And this is going to be pretty common with, uh, with mobile applications. They have to be pretty aggressive for throwing things out of memory, especially to sort of make memory available to other uh, applications. And so, um, so that's been a bit of a pain is, you know, oftentimes you build an app for the iPhone or other mobile devices, and you're hoping it's going to be sort of a long-term running app. Uh, you know, the experience is you get it up, you do a couple other things, you come back and you're forced into a full page refresh with no cache. And it's a slow network. So um, that's been some of the pain points from a usability standpoint for the mobile devices. Hi. Hi. Do you have any uh, experience or thoughts on doing progressive enhancements using Quit? What do you mean by progressive enhancements? Uh, you know, enabling uh, more sort of DHTML functionality uh, as the ca capabilities of the browser or the platform uh, increase. We have stayed out of that world. 
We have, um, so we, we have a nice way of taking advantage of things when they come out. We all have opinions about what should be there and what should not be there. Um, and so we've sort of positioned ourselves to be the uh, ultimate, uh, ultimately pragmatic in that realm. And that, uh, and you'll hear, a, if you go to the uh, deferred binding talk for, for instance, tomorrow, you know, that's, that's a way that in which we take advantage of, brow uh, of browsers that have special functionality already. Um, so, you know, for us, we're really pragmatic about that decision. We don't actually sort of try to push enhancements because it's the wrong place to do it in our mind. Uh, having your users uh, sort of, you know, having your users come to a browser and, you know, get un unsupported messages or not have the same functionality in each browser is, is much worse than, it's not a good place to make a statement in our mind. Um, we'd rather have the users have the good experience. We'll find another channel to actually try to, uh, you know, encourage browser makers to um, add whatever functionality would help to make web applications even better. Is there a question right up here? Uh, one of the things that we've uh, experienced is with a mix of HTML and the GWT code is that the HTML parses first, and so it's the first thing that the user sees. And then as the script executes and you build up all your UI widgets, some, suddenly your UI pops into place on top of what was initially there from the right. HTML. And sort of similar things is where you've got some sort of process that takes a long time to execute. Is it better to try and sort of wait and present everything sort of at once or to try and show things incrementally, which may annoy the user if things are sort of popping in? So it, I, think it, I think it's better to show things incrementally, but uh, having things move and resize is really bad. So what you want to do is look for places to incremental load where you know the size and you can sort of go ahead and alloc alloc uh, allocate the space for it. Like the classic example of this was, was images, right? In most cases, you know what the size of images are. And even though you're going to get them sometime in the future, go ahead and make them the right size. It was a huge, it's a simple change, but it actually gives you uh, huge benefits in terms of when the uh, user interface comes up, it's stable. I think having it stable is the, uh, that's a really big deal. Because if you talk about time to interaction, that means that that is the first time where I can literally start pushing on something. If something is moving around as I'm trying to push on it, it's really hard to hit. So I think the key is to, to sort of look at the things uh, in your startup that you can go ahead and put on the screen. They're going to be stable, and you can come in and fill in the details later. Um, but, but I wouldn't try to get so aggressive in it that you're literally having things move as the application starts, because uh, you know, that just pushes the waiting for the interface to load. Uh, it actually, the perceived uh, wait time is even longer because you can't really use it when it comes up and it's just moving. So overall, you're still at the same perceived load time. Um, you're just showing them a bunch of moving stuff, right? We have time for one or two more questions. I have one, actually. Uh, what, what, in your experience, can uh, people concerned about usability learn from the game design community? It's actually a little bit of a mixed bag. So, um, so on one hand, those guys have always gotten the responsiveness thing right. They had to get it right. On the other hand, they've also been the, uh, the, the leading uh, uh, culture for changing UI conventions. So, you know, if there's one thing you can learn from them, th their sort of obsession to being responsive to what the human was doing, because in a lot of cases, they were making uh, and continue to make severe compromise where you're literally doing calculations that are wrong because it's better to show somebody something that has a 0.1 or 0.01 error and it's almost right and, and the human doesn't really perceive it as being wrong. It's better to show them that than to actually spend the next five minutes calculating the correct thing. So, you know, that sort of, you know, human perception ahead of correctness, I actually like that standpoint. But, you know, I'll also say that those guys uh, have, have for a number of really real reasons, have reinvented their UI conventions over and over, and that has continued to be problematic for users.